why simple investment stats don't give you good returns. So I just returned from vacation from Aruba. Now I've always wanted to go to Aruba just because of that song. You know which one I mean, uh, Kokomo, you know, uh, so uh, Aruba, Jamaica, ooh, I want to take you. So it's always made me want to go to Aruba. Now the funny thing is, you know, the critics pan that. They still rate that as one of the worst songs of all time, but I like it. It's always made me want to go to Aruba. So now it's a neat area, you know, part of the ABC Islands, Aruba, Bonaire, uh, Curacao. These are Dutch islands and they look like um, old Europe, you know, these painted painted buildings. It's kind of neat. You can tell it's got, you know, it's a richer, uh, richer islands than most of the, of, the Car of the Caribbean. So, but now uh, you could take a submarine down there, go to the uh, ocean floor, and one of the things that you see is this. This is the ship Morningstar that was intentionally sunk is sitting on the uh, bottom of the ocean. Now, it's a cool metaphor. So the, the, the reason they sunk it was to promote the growth of coral. So now Morningstar is, you know, probably the single most used investment data software. And uh, it gets used a lot. It actually causes a lot of problems for people. And so it's actually a really cool metaphor, you know, that we, we sink Morningstar in order to get better growth. It, uh, it's kind of, kind of a, neat, a neat metaphor. So uh, now, yeah, so a lot of people use these, um, they use various investment data software, you know, professionals use uh, Morningstar or Bloomberg, or, or there's a bunch of other ones. So, and um, so now the reason why I'm showing, and actually even a lot of individual investors use it, because you can just Google Morningstar and investment, it'll, and they'll tell you some things about it, but there's some real big issues with the data that you see, you got to know how to, how to use it effectively. So now the purpose of this video is two things. First of all, what I, I find it's for you know long-term investors and you know, for example, our clients who will have you know like really exceptional investments. However, some of the time they have see they seem to have um, the stats which will, will will look bad, or even the rating systems will will rate them bad. So why would that happen if you have really good investments? So and part of this also is for you know I talk to a lot of people on the blogs and a lot of individual investors, and I see what they do with with short-term data. And I can see how it often drags down and reduces what the you know what the what their investment performance is. So now what we're going to learn today is. Why do good investments have bad stats some of the time? Okay, so we're going to go three here. Why do investors that use investment stats and ratings usually have lower returns? How do investment stats affect your behavior? How can you use investment data effectively? How does a financial plan change how you use investment stats? And then I'll just get at the end, I'm going to give you my unconventional wisdom on using investment stats effectively. So when I was new in the investment business a few decades ago, I, I used to use a lot of these short-term stats. And so I know kind of, I understand how they use, I went through that learning process, I think that a lot of uh, investors do. So, you know, I look at these short-term stats and look at, you know, what's done well recently and I'm trying to switch back and forth to it. And, and what I found after doing that for a while is it's lots of effort and yet returns were just really not that good. So why did that tend to happen? So now what happens is this investment data often gets misused because it's it, because um, uh, for a couple of reasons. So one is it tends to be mostly very, the focus for most people when they look at it is the short-term data, or and it's also the data is very uh, in-based bias. It's based on whatever, whenever you do it. So, you know, well, I guess what people often do when they look at the, you know, just click on one of your returns or year-to-date returns or something short-term to see, okay, what's doing well recently, and then try to switch over to that. Thinking that that if I have a if my investment has done well recently, that it'll keep going well. <clears throat> Problem is, you know, investments go through cycles, and that's not what happens. You know, it's uh, you can't past returns don't tell you what future returns are going to be. So and and the, it all goes through cycles. So also, you know, the one, three, and five year returns. If you get investments that have, that have a, a you know their uh, lower returns over the three and five year today, but if you looked a year ago, they were among the highest, you know? So you have to really take them with a grain of salt. You have to think of what's going on recently. Uh, you know, if you have five year returns that are good or bad, that doesn't mean that they, you had five good or bad years. It may mean you had one 
good or bad year, and then the other four were something completely different. So as long as it's all based on what the, you know, the most recent uh, year is, the most recent recent year is you know all of the one year stat, a third of the three year stat, and twenty percent of the five year stat. So it just colors the the whole thing. <clears throat> So, uh, so now if you're, the difference is, let's say you're in a, in a bull market, your big, strong bull market, then you're going to see that you tend to see higher numbers for all the one, three, and five-year stats. You can see, wow, it's made 15% a year for the last five years, but that's not actually the long-term return. It's just because last year it made, you know, 30% or something like that. Similar to this year being a down year, it can make, look, make it look like your three and five-year stats aren't that good, but it's because we have the one, you know, it's the one down year that's in there. Um, a lot of people also look at the charts. It's a, you know, you look at, you can quickly um, look on the internet, find the investment, and see the chart of how it's done compared to the index. And again, it's very end date specific. It's even start date specific. So a chart will always look at a specific period of time. And that period of time may look completely different. Like if you compare it to investments, you see one's higher, but change a different time period, now the other one's higher. So it's, it's, it doesn't necessarily tell you what you, um, you have to always understand, like think of what what time periods you're looking at, and what does that actually tell you. Now, Morningstar also has ratings, so they have five star ratings. The in investment they rate investment between one star and five star. Five star is supposedly the best, one star supposedly the worst. And so you think, well, you know what? Let's just have all five star investments. So okay, but um, the problem with that is, first of all, it's based on. I, like usually you're looking at like the three year, uh, the three year um, star rating, and that's recent returns. So um, it it doesn't necessarily happen. In fact, a lot of five star funds become two star funds the next year, and you go back to five star funds. And actually, interestingly, I, I saw a, a study a few years back. I was trying to find it now, but I couldn't find it right now. But it actually showed that if you buy five years, five star funds and hold them versus two star funds and hold them, in general, the two star funds tend to outperform the five star. And that's because often it's the same funds that, are, that have good and bad in different years and you're just buying them lower when they're when they're two star funds. So the, the ratings uh, tell you some things, but not necessarily, but you can't just use them in exclusion. And, you know, they do have, let's uh, say a 10 year, you think a 10, 10 year five star rating one must be much or worthwhile. What happens is a lot of investments haven't necessarily been out for 10 years. And then you don't you don't necessarily have that, you don't have that many to, to compare to. So now the star ratings are based on risk and return and statistical formula that they're based on. And you know, like so for us growth based investors, we're often more interested in getting the high long-term rate of return than we are in you know re reducing our short-term our short-term uh, fluctuation. So that's why in, in general, we're, you know, I, I think we're more interested in what the higher return, what the long-term return is more so than what the rating would be. So, you know, there's also all kinds of um, uh, statistics that you can get, you know, you get alpha, which is supposedly manager value added, um, you know, sharp ratio, trainer, there's all kinds of statistics, um, alpha, beta, gamma, that, that they'll tell you about, about investments. But all of those are, you know, they they all tell you a story. You have to understand what they tell you, but you, but also you have to understand what what it tells you in the time period that you're looking at. So now, one of the problems with looking at it is um, looking at stats can actually uh, lead you to want to change your investments. Okay, and. <clears throat> So and you end up changing them to you know whatever's popular today, and you know like because we have human guts that tend to uh, you know make you want to uh, either flight or fri uh, flight or fright. So um, fight or flight, right? So we're we're trying to you actually always trying to get into the whatever the latest thing is by looking at it. You see, oh, if, I, if I'm doing well, I think, oh, let's pile onto this investment because doing well, or this one, you know, it's been down recently. You want you want to get out of it. And so by looking at these things, it often uh, motivates you to do things that are wrong. So yeah, what, what you end up doing, doing is buying high, because you buy what's what we've done well recently and selling low. So you heard you should buy low and sell high, but I find that the people that look at these investment stats a lot tend to do the opposite. And that's why they tend to have lower long-term returns. There's a company called Dalbar that's done some studies that change what they do and how they do them a bit, but they've done them kind of every year. And they used, they used to always um, 
you know, compare the returns of investors to the investments they have. And, you know, in general, investors make two to three percent per year lower return than the investment they have. So now, of course, it's not hard to get the return of the investment you have. All you do is buy it and hold it. You get the return, right? But they don't have that rate of return. And it's because they, most investors buy it when it's high, and then they'll sell it when it's low. Now, the classic one of that was um, one of the great investors of all time was Peter Lynch um, back in the, in, the, in the 80s. He had a fund called the Magellan Fund, quite an amazing return. So he managed it from 1977 to 90. And his rate of return was 29.2% per year for that 13-year period. Amazing return, 29.2% per year. So now that was more than double. The, the, the return per year was more than double what, what the S&P 500 is. Abs absolutely great return. Now, once looking at actually the investors that owned that fund, most of them lost money. Now, how can you lose money in a fund that makes 29.2% per year for 13 years? And the reason is they bought it when it was high, like it wasn't 29 every year, there's up and down, up and down years, big and small years, right? So it has a good year, everybody piles in after the gain, and it goes down and they get out after the after the loss. And most of the investors in that fund actually lost money. But it was bad, you know, investor behavior. It wasn't because it wasn't a, because it wasn't a good quality investments. So, um, yeah, so the, the look at these stats in down markets, it tends to encourage you to switch to more conservative investments. Right. And then in strong markets, it, it try to mo motivates you to buy whatever's the highest growth, whatever has been doing, doing really well. So, it also gives you, um, like it, it gives you kind of a weird um, um, confidence that you shouldn't have. Um, um, I got a market timing delusion that by looking at these stats, you think, well, these are good actual stats. Therefore, I'm doing something smart by by reacting to them, and you get this delusion that you're, that you're doing something well. And there's a word for it. It's called the Dunning Kruger effect. Now, the Dunning Kruger Kruger effect. What it is is it's basically people that are not skilled tend to believe they're superior, while people who are really skilled at something, uh, you know, tend to see all the complexities and and uh, and and all that. So often you'll find the people that are that talk very sure about something are the ones that know the least about it. And the ones that are they're really the experts, though that's always more nuanced. Well there's different there's different sides and this is the general advice. And you're, so it's uh, and so by looking at all these stats, you get this sense of confidence and, and you don't you don't really know much about it other than this this investment's done re well this year, so let's buy into it. So it's it, uh, it gives you a sense of confidence that you shouldn't have without doing you know way more research on what it is. So, now, how do how would you use this investment data effectively? So I can show you how most investors use it badly, and that's why it actually it actually produces good returns. So most investors would be better off not looking at it, um, or look at it once, pick your investment, and that's it. Don't look at it again. So, however, um, there are ways to look at it effectively. So, and a few of them are this. So, one is um, uh, you got to look through the different market cycles. Okay, so you got to. So that's why you need to pick longer periods of time. And uh, there is a classic article called uh, "The Super Investment Investors of Graham and Doddswell." I'm going to show you that uh, near the end of this video, but. And it's and I'll have a link to a link to it. It's a classic article um, by Warren Buffett, written in 1984, just about a bunch of his value investor friends and how awesome their returns were. It's called the Super Investors of Graham and Doddsville. So um, it's on my blog. But also one of them on there was actually really cool. It's, the guy's name is Rick Guerin. He had a fund called Pacific Partners, and um, so he had a career from 1965 to 83. Um, and his return, he, he believe it or not, you know, S and P 500 is a difficult index to beat, but he beat it by 25.1 percent per year. So in that in that 19 year period of time. Um, his average return was 33% per year, indexed at eight. So absolutely amazing return. Now, 19 years, out of those 19 years, um, he beat the index 13 times, and six of those years he lagged it. So only a, like, and that's, I think generally I find that to be true. The really top investors tend to beat the index about two-thirds of years, and a third of the time they don't. Okay, so... Um, 
So that's that's kind of a thing. So nothing nothing outperforms all the time, and that's uh, and often you're better off like you have a really great investment. You the best thing you can do is just hold it. And there's going to be times when whatever you have doesn't look good, but you got to look through that. And that's why it's important when you look at data, look at something long term, look at 10 years or more or something like that. Don't look at the one, three, five, the longer term. Um, I mean, the problem is not investments, not many that many investments or a lot of investments don't have that long a track record, but you still want to be able to do that. Now you can often get much more by comparing similar investments. So for example, you take several global growth funds or several global value funds and similar ones to see how they do. And the reason is because a lot of times the difference between two investments can be just between the what's happening in the market right now, as opposed to which one's actually better. You know, 2020 was this awesome growth year. And uh, if you compare any two investments, the one that was more growthy it outperformed the one that was more value-based. And this year, 2022 is a down year. So the get the value-based investments will have, or generally down quite a lot less than the growth based. So, but that doesn't, you know, those that alone doesn't tell you which one's a better investment long term. So you better if you compare similar types of investments and compare how they do in in periods where growth does well or real value does well, or uh, or different, you know, uh, bull markets and bear markets, it'll give you a much better uh, understanding of it. So another thing you do is just compare to the index. And, you know, comparing again over a period of time, remember, nobody beats the index all the time, even the guys that mm -hmm. that um, beat it fairly significantly over the long term. So, and what I'm going to suggest in there is, is uh, compare it to a broad index, like the MSCI uh, World Index or the S&P 500 or something like that. If you're, in a, if you're just sticking to Canadian investors, use the TSX 60, um, you know, total return investments. So, so, so you use... Um, these now because the software will actually um uh, uh some of the software will, will give you a best fit so they'll look at whatever index is closest to the one that you have but that's generally not the, what you want because let's say you have a, a, a global investor and a global fund and he's and he's buying different sort of focus uh budget europe or buying a bunch of budget focus much in Asia and then the next year is much in the US. And what will happen is the best fit will change to different indexes over time based on what they did. But you know, if you were buying the index, you wouldn't know how to make those, those changes that you did. So it's a more effective just you know, compare it to the broad, the broad index. And that's a good way to tell, you know, in general how it, the fund, if, you know, if you have a 10 year return, you're the head of the index over 10 years, that that's you know most of the time that's what you want you want a long term outperforming the index but you're not always not nearly always maybe if you can beat the one year two thirds of the time that's that's uh, pretty good so um, yes and we want to compare similar uh, investments in similar markets um, yeah so some of the things that we sometimes look at is um, you know we we'll take a bull market. And we'll just take the beginning and end of the bull market and compare similar investments. That's what they did in the bull market. And then we'll take it. This is a decline. We'll go from the beginning to the end of the decline. Let's do, let's compare what they did over there. And then, for example, we'll look at okay, the first month or the first three months from the bottom. How did they do? Right from the bottom, did they get the often when you know when it, when the market is goes down quite a bit, there's a big surge up at the beginning or at the beginning, and did they get it? And what happens is, you see quite a few funds. What happens is they're getting more conservative as investments go down because they're trying to lose less. But then when the market starts to recover, they miss the first big surge of the recovery, and some and sometimes more of it. So you want to know someone that's you know it's going to get that get that recovery for you. So. Uh, yeah, and you can also look at, you know, uh, indexes and index funds. You know, I think a lot of people look at, you know, indexes uh, managed versus not, but it really, it's not really indexes are just another mutual fund. So indexes are managed with a specific process and just think of them that way. They have investment committees or, for, you know, formula that says what holdings are going to be in the index. Um, they usually change five or 10 or percent of the fund has changed I think a certain percent of the indexes change every year and it's done mostly based on uh you know liquidity and the size of the investment of the you know it's not really it's not based on an evaluation of which are good holdings so think of an index index fund or etf as a mutual fund 
that's managed with a specific style and you can just compare it to others and see which one makes sense for you. So now part of what you can do is um, you can avoid making some common mistakes. So, so you can rule out methods that don't work or not are not optimal. So for example, don't, don't buy into the popular sectors, whatever the currently popular thing is, that's gone up a lot recently. Generally, you should not buy that because unless you think it's going to be, it's going to run up for years, most of the time, by buying it after it's gone up a lot, you're buying high. So another thing is avoid the really people that are good marketers. So all these bu buzzwords, when you see that whatever the current hot buzzword is, um, generally those things you want to avoid. So, so, you know, the last few years we've had, you know, low volatility funds and smart beta. And so you get things that have buzzwords and generally you want to avoid all that stuff. And, and let's stick with solid, really well-managed investments. So um, also um, closet indexers, it's something that we look at a lot when we're evaluating fund managers. So, um, but to me is we generally prefer active management because we, we do find some fund managers that outperform the indexes over time and have long-term track records and we're confident that they would do it. We generally prefer active investment to indexing. All right, but the what? But you are paying a fee for it, so you want to make sure it's that after that what's important is the returns after fees are they are they higher? And indexes tend to have, of course, much lower fees, right? Or the index itself has got no fee; it's just the it's just the index. Index fund would have a low a lower fee, but what's your rate of return after fees is what the important thing is. So, but what the, what you don't want to do is pay the high fee for a closet indexer. So a closet indexer is a fund that stays pretty close to what the index does. Pardon me. It stays pretty close to what the index does, but um, but you're paying the full management fee. So if you're paying the full management fee, I want a really good fund manager that's doing the full management. So so you can uh, there's a stat there called um, uh, sorry, I'm thinking of the name for a second. You know, there's a specific stat that, that that measures. It's called active share, and it'll it measures the, the extent towards you, that your fund holdings are different from what the index is. And generally, you want something that's 95 percent or more, that's so completely different from the index. So, another thing that I would that I suggest to avoid is avoid in-house investments. So that's so investments sold by whoever your advisor's investment company is. So you go to the bank or a certain number of investments, uh, and boy, you go to your advisor, and the investment is owned by that company. In general, it's it's not a good idea to have to buy those because you don't know if you're getting um, unbiased advice. It could be that the uh, advisor is getting more commissions that way. It could be that they get more. Uh, other benefits from the company by, by using these investments. So um, generally recommend, you know, if you're whatever your advisor is, don't buy investments that are from his company. So you want to buy something that's independent so that, you know, you're getting, you're getting unbiased advice. So um, now when we look at fund managers. We usually we usually try to avoid fund managers that are employees of the company. So uh, um, if you have a big, bank or insurance company or something, and then they will have a fund and the fund manager is an employee of that bank or insurance company. They're, they're, they're usually not the top fund managers. The top fund managers usually have their own fund management firm. They'll get a contract to manage it. And you'll so you'll see that the the, the firm that's managing the fund is, is different from the, the actual fund company. So uh, another thing we look for is avoiding style drift. So you get a, um, so and these are all things that you can look for in the in the data. Like you can look. For, so when you're looking at you know at the data, don't just look at rates of return. Look at you know, who's the manager, what's the tra uh, track record of the manager, and look at look for these. Like so, how do we how do we uh, are they a closet indexer? So and also looking for style drift because the, the the data will tell you whether the holdings are generally growth style or value style or large cap or small cap or something. And you want someone that's, you know, if, if you're getting a growth manager, you want a growth manager because you're gonna pair them up with a value manager. So you don't want someone that's changing styles all the time because then how do you fit them into a portfolio? How do you know where, where they are? So now in general, we avoid quants. 
So the people that that uh, the fund managers, if you you can find the fund manager and read, try to read something about what they do, and the ones that are just using all kinds of data but actually aren't, you know, the experienced investment people that know the companies and know how to invest, um, you know, so quants can do all kinds of amazing things, uh, and you know, what I find with a lot of them do reasonably well, but but they're they're almost never the really top investors. So, and of course, you know, you've heard my other videos is just to try to avoid home, home country bias. So, you know, our investments, even though we're in Canada, I love living in Canada, but it's not a good company to country to invest in. So we tend to have almost nothing in Canada. Like Canada is 3% of the world stock market. So to me is we generally have between zero and 3% of our investments in, uh, in Canada. And then we're generally a lower growth country than, you know, US and Asia. And so most of the money you want to probably have uh, elsewhere. You don't want to have a Canadian, you don't want to have anything just because it's Canadian. You want to have whatever the best company in the world is. So now my general in wisdom in general on investment data, okay, so is, uh, so if you're confident, first of all, if you're confident in your advisor and your investments, you don't actually have to look at this much, okay? Because if you if you know that they're, they're looking after it and you're confident what they're doing, just ride it a long time. And it's the long-term investors that do well. So studies actually show that the less often you look at your portfolio, the better you do. For example, I a weird study that actually showed how often you look at it. You know, do you look at it every, every day, every week, every month, every year? And they found that the investors that had the higher returns were the ones that even only looked at their portfolio every two years, which seems much longer than I would have expected. But it's because, you know, they most of the time you're just riding it. You're just getting the growth. You're not, you know, trying to make changes all the time. So um, now, so, but again, if you're a company advisor, a good thing to do is just think, let's keep general tabs on it. So, you know, you can pull up your investments, look at the long-term track record. How's it doing compared to the index? Um, and another important thing is that how's it doing comparing to, compared to the rate of return on your financial plan? So you have a financial plan, you have to make, let's say, 8% a year over the long term. So do the investments that you have, look at the rate of return for the 10 years or 15 years, have, have they actually averaged 8% a year after these? And of course, you want them, you know, you may have the odd time at a low in the market where your 10-year market is a bit below that. But in general, you, like, you want investments that the bulk of the time, they're, they're, they're averaging more than that. So you have confidence it's going to be enough to provide for your, you know, the future that you're looking for. So, so now a key thing is when you have a financial plan, uh, part of it is, you know, exactly how you're going to retire and what, how much you have to invest and what rate of return you need to make. So if your return is 7 or 8%, or whatever it is, you have a number, a rate of return that you need to make to achieve you know, the future that you want. Um, generally, you should buy, you should only invest in investments that can make that rate of return. So if you need 8% as a long-term rate of return, um, only buy investments where you are confident the long-term risk return, 20-year return is going to be more than eight. And that's, so a lot of investors, you know, the, the classic investment industry is gets into this asset allocation of stocks, bonds, and cash. The problem is the bonds and cash aren't going to give you 8% a year. They're going to give you quite a lot less, right? So that means the stocks have to make 10 or 12% or, or, or a lot more so that you average eight of the overall portfolio. So a smarter thing to do is, so... Any investment that you don't expect, like bonds and cash, you don't expect them to make eight, don't have any of that stuff. So try to find a portfolio that's within your, your risk level, but also it's it's really important that you, you know, have investments where you're confident each one of them should average more than 8% a year as a long-term rate of return. So and remember, you're looking at these stats. What we're really trying to do is we're trying to to get insight into which investments are best managed and which ones are we the most confident in, you know, the 20 year return. That's what we're, so we're trying to uh, predict long-term future returns. Now looking at past returns, especially in specific markets can tell us a lot about it, but you know, the last past return is not, is certainly not the future, not necessarily the future return. So again, focus on long-term stats, you know, 10 years plus or more. And then another thing is, is 
for what uh, this is my my insight as a growth investor as a financial planner trying to achieve goals it's it's more important to focus on the growth than a risk address adjusted growth so i'd rather have a good 10 percent 10 year rate of return or 15 or 20 year rate of return as opposed to having uh, a good star rating or good statistics or something like that and i'll give you a simple example let's say you had two investments that are pretty similar but over 10 years one of them had 10 percent higher return the other one um, declines by 10% less when there are these short-term market declines. So which one of the two would you rather have? Now, I'd rather just have the higher, you know, one of the higher rate of return. So, and, you know, I think the, where the investment industry gets this kind of all wrong is they're always focused on, you know, risk return. So, but there is actually a benefit of having higher risk, like risk meaning short-term investment fluctuation. Right? So to me, remember, risk is the level of confidence. Am I 90%, 95%? How confident am I that I'm getting a 20-year return of 8% or more? That's risk. Okay. So, But a short-term decline, the market falls 20 or 30% and then recovers. Okay, that's, that's not risk. Okay. And a simple way to look at it is, let's say you're buying toilet paper and there's two brands and they're basically the same. They're the they're about the same price, they have the same quality, um, so very similar. The only difference is one of them goes on sale every once in a while. Once in a while, you can get it for 20 to 30% off, and the other one doesn't. Which one would you want to have? If you say you had to buy the same brand all the way through. So I'd rather have the one that goes on sale. It's the same thing when you have investments that are a bit more volatile, you're getting bigger buying opportunities when you can buy more. That means you can get a higher rate of return from those over time, even if the actual investment rate of return is the same by, by, by buying more when it's down. So, so, and another thing, because we're trying to get this higher long-term rate of return, we're focused on that, uh, we tend not to, to invest in things that, that, that are just there defensively to reduce volatility, but that are gonna drag down your returns, such as you know asset allocation or balance funds or bonds or fixed income or other defensive strategies like, like dividends or income or the low volatility or like we're trying to avoid all that stuff. And let's let's buy the solid, well-managed investments that we're confident in a long-term rate of return. So um, yeah, so you're trying to find investments that you're that you're confident in the long-term return. You can hold them long term. You may or may not actually hold them the whole time, but but you want to buy them with the intention that um, with the intention that that you will hold them long-term. You're gonna make smarter decisions if you buy an investment that you tend to, that you intend to hold for 10 or 20 years, as opposed to one, I'm gonna buy it and I'm gonna sell it soon, as soon as it uh, gets to another point. You're gonna make smarter decisions if you're buying things that you intend to hold long-term. So now also uh, what we're trying to understand from looking at all these stats is looking at trying to identify the top fund managers and look for the ones that have skill. Now that's, it's quite, you know, like how do you identify skill is actually takes a lot of experience, a lot of, um, you know, a, a general um, understanding on what it is. So it's not that easy. There's no one stat that tells you what the skill level is, but that's kind of what you're trying to look through all the stats and understand which ones are well managed or not, or not. And that's why this is where it gets complicated and where it's generally better to get good advice. So now we've been doing this for years. We've been studying fund managers for years and we kind of learned over the time what to look for and what, you know, to identify skills. So first of all, we very much study their process. So, so what's, how do they choose, how does a fund manager choose the, the stocks, the holdings that it has in, in their in their fund, and they may have a process. It might be growth or value or whatever. There's all kinds of different processes that they would have, and you want to understand what their process is. And it's often very nuanced. Like when do they buy? Uh, how many holdings? Like what makes them want to sell? And we've learned over the over the years what kind of processes generally work and which ones don't. So uh, we we look at returns in various markets. So like, how do they do in a growth market? How do they do, like versus, we'll compare them to the index, for example, um, in, a, in, a, in a bull market, in a bear market, the first month after, after you know, from the bottom of the decline, the first month going up. So we'll look at various things that, that'll tell us a lot, a lot more about, about the fund and, and how it's managed. You can, you can gain a lot of understanding of how it's managed just by analyzing, by 
looking at how, how it responds in certain um, market conditions. So now, and also each fund manager has a systematic advantage. The top fund managers have a reason why they beat the market long-term. They have something systematic that's their advantage. And the really interesting thing is about studying these fund managers is it's different in every case. And it's always, it's often a surprise. Everyone's got the, their own way of looking at it. And um, when you understand these, it's, it's actually, when you, it's when, that's when you really kind of understand what the, what the Fed manager is really doing. Like, so, you know, let's say they have a long-term track record beating the index. They beat it by five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. So is that skill or is it luck? Now, the longer time period is, the more likely it's skill. All right, but but you still need to kind of understand like how did they beat it, and 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 why is that? So I'll give you a few, a few examples. So uh, some fund manager will say they use time arbitrage. So they buying they're buying the stocks that they expect to have really good returns over five, six, seven years, not one, two, three years. And by do doing that, they're buying they're looking at different companies, and that that is the secret of why they tend to outperform. So a lot of fund managers tend, tend to have very focused portfolios. You know, the index may have, you know, uh, 500 or 1,500 holdings in it. So, um, however, the top fund managers will have maybe 20 or 25 or 30 holdings. They're very focused. And by having just a few really good holdings, uh, so most of the top investors have a very focused portfolio. There are not too many holdings at all because, they can, you know, why would you have your, you just have your top 20 top 20 stocks, why would you want to have 50 or 100? Why, instead of, you know, why not just have more of your top 20, you know, enough to be diversified, but just have your few best ones. So um, now, so most of them try to be focused, but occasionally, especially that you, it's, it's, you get fund managers where their competitive advantage is the opposite. So especially when you're in small companies, you buy some small cap uh, growth funds. Growth, small cap growth tends to be a really difficult, difficult area because you get a lot of junk in there. And so lots of them go bankrupt. And so generally small cap growth underperforms small cap value and even large cap growth. So even though it's small companies that would grow, but um, but um, but in the small cap, both growth and value, there sometimes it can make sense to have lots of holdings, you know, 500 holdings that are all these little tiny companies. What's going to happen is you got to get some 10 baggers. Uh, the 10 bagger is a company that rises at 10 times its value or more. So when you own lots of like these little companies, some of them are going to grow a lot and some of them are going to go bankrupt. So you don't necessarily, you can analyze, you know, you can study them all you want, but you don't necessarily know what's all going to happen with them. But, you know, if you have one 10 bagger, that makes up for 10 companies that go bankrupt. So by all the, so sometimes with small companies, owning lots of them is actually an advantage, even though for most uh, fund managers, you want something very, very focused. So... Uh, some fund managers, the way they outperform is just by getting all the growth. Okay, so what they what I mean is they're just focused on the growth. They they don't look at, at reducing short term risk at all. So you see when the markets are going down, they tend to go down more than the index. Um, but then when they go up, they also go up more than the index. So but they're, by being a bit more volatile in both directions, they're you know the market goes up seventy five percent of the time. So by by being um, uh, by being a higher risk level or a higher volatility level in both directions, there, there's a quite a good chance that they're going to beat it over time. So, and it's not just by because they're all focused on all one sector; it's because they they're actually they're actually you know having the higher growth companies. The, generally, the companies that grow the most long term also will drop the most in you know in, in a market decline. So that could be the competitive advantage for a fund manager. So um, another one could be that they just have better contacts. They've got lots of experience and they just know a lot of the CEOs and they got really good information. And then they meet with the CEOs and they ask smarter questions. And so it, um, it can just be, that can be the competitive advantage. So I'm just giving you a few examples of uh, every fund manager, we, we like, we get to meet with them and we like to actually ask them. So how, what is the reason that you've been outperforming? Yeah, I, so, what do you think the reason is? What's your competitive advantage over the index? And uh, when you understand that, then you can really get, uh, you, you get a much better idea of what you're actually investing in and is this really what you want to have? So now we advise them to get regular updates from these fund managers. And a lot of them are often 
for advisors only. And, and part of it is um, for an investment company to release something to the public has to get compliance and regulatory approvals and all that. But you know they can just send out more more informative uh, information that goes to advisors only. I mean, we read all that stuff, trying to understand you know uh, what all these what all these investments are actually doing. You know, it's actually really neat that we get to meet them personally because a, a lot of it you can tell somehow just sizing up a person when you see how they invest and you meet the person and see what kind of person they are that it's just so now all of a sudden you get a much much clearer idea of who's managing it so when you're buying it all a fun really what you're buying is the manager so think of it as hiring a manager and you know it's so it's it's a really good idea to meet them meet them personally see what kind of person they are and then you see their style and, and what kind of person they are, and it just makes you get a better understanding of what you're investing in. Okay, so this is the Super Investors of Graham and Dodds the article I, I mentioned. It, this is just the one page of it that kind of shows what it is, but it's a great art article to be able to show. And um, so this is uh, that's my talk for today. So th this is uh, what you've learned. You know why good investments and I have bad ratings sometimes. Why do investors that use investment stats usually have lower returns? How to use investment stats effective, or how does it affect your behavior? How can you use them effectively? How does a financial plan affect how you use them? And then I give you my insight on some of the some of the main reasons that we look at to be able to use it use it effectively. So. All right, so um, this is uh, my blog, and my name is Ed Rempel. And my, my blog is called Unconventional Wisdom. It's the number one blog in Canada for a financial planner. And it's uh, edrempel.com. And you can hit contact and get a free 30 minute consultation if you're interested in talking to us about uh, whether or not it makes sense for us to work together. And if you can like and subscribe the, 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 my, to my blog, subscribe to the blog, and also to the YouTube channel. All that means we don't market to people at all. All that means is well, I try to do a new video article every third day. And if you subscribe to them, you'll get all my uh, my new videos sent directly to your, uh, to your email every week. Well, thanks a lot for listening, and we'll talk to you next week.